For the sacrifice he made Another round of holy fear Built an ark the world to save Another left his homeland And as a stranger he'd reside But none received the promise then And so in faith they died Morning, everyone, and Good morning. happy Mother's Day, huh? That was not a very enthusiastic response. I mean, this is this is Mother's Day here, you know. So I just thought I'd open up with a real quick word about about mothers. All I have to say about mothers is that mothers are beautiful. Okay, they are truly beautiful. They are probably the most beautiful people in the world. What can I say? And this is your day. I hope you're getting pampered. If you're not, something's wrong. I'd have words with uh, husband and children if I were you, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> it's nice to see you all here this morning. Welcome to Crossroads Church. If you're still out in the entryway, come on in, find a seat and get comfortable. And uh, let's get going with our call to worship, shall we? Well, I hear the say in the streets, Jesus is alive. Crossroads shirts, everybody, this morning. And once again, happy Mother's Day to everybody. We have a lovely daughter right now. Daughter of Christ and the daughter of the Fernsides. Emily Fernside with uh, some important happenings here at church. Good morning. Yeah, okay, you already know what I'm going to make you do because that was really pathetic. Good morning. That was better. Thank you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Emily, and if you are new to Crossroads, a special welcome goes out to you today, and a happy Mother's Day if you're a mom and you're visiting us for the first time. 
I have just a couple of quick announcements for you. First of all, in your bulletin, there's the ever famous two pieces of white paper. The larger one is our attendance sheet. If you could fill that out and put it in the offering basket when it goes by, that'd be great. And the smaller one is our prayer card. If there's anything going on in your life that you want somebody in this church to pray for you about, if you could please fill this out and put it in the offering basket. And you can even tell like who you want to pray for you. You can have just Pastor Paul pray for you, or you can have our prayer chain pray for you, or anybody that you want to have pray for you, we can get that taken care of. Also, May 20th is a really big day in our church. Um, there's a newcomer breakfast at 9 o'clock in the morning ahead of time. So if you are new here, we're going to have a special like kind of reception for you guys, and it's going to be really, really fun. And that also happens to be our volunteer appreciation Sunday. And there's going to be like a kind of reception and a banquet and all that kind of stuff after the service. So it's just a big day. That's May 20th again. Also, there's a change in where cross-training is going to be this week. It's going to be at the Trinity Care Center in Farmington at 645. And you can call the church office for more information or else there's a little bit more about it in your bulletin. Um, speaking of the, the kids, um, we need some more teachers and assistants. So if you feel a tug on your heart to work with little kids and to teach them, and oh, they're so much fun. I loved working with them. So we need people like that. If you are interested in doing that, you can talk to Deb Marzon. And also, a prayer small group is starting this Wednesday, and they're doing a study on the book Partners in Prayer, and that's by John Maxwell. And this book really shows people how to like unleash the power of prayer. So much stuff can be done through prayer that a lot of people haven't recognized yet. So this small group's really gonna focus on that. There is a big a yellow sheet of paper in your bulletin about that if you need more information. And there is a correction. Until the end of the school year, they will be meeting here at 6.30 excuse me and after that they're going to be meeting at Katie Kravis's house which is right across the street from North Trail Elementary now, there's nobody up here I think the kids are singing no oh I'm wrong again okay kids come forward children's time no not children's time okay I don't know what it is it's a drama For my mom. What for? Well, it's almost Mother's Day, you nuts. Oh, I know that, but what's in here? Well, stuff. Gifts for my mom. I wanted her to. Sh I wanted to show her that I love her and show her all the appreciation for all the things she's done for me all these years. You make it sound like you have one foot in the grave all these years. <laughs> Well, you know what I mean. She's been there all my life. I mean, she's always been there for me. And it means a lot to me, and I just want to tell her that. Well, won't a card of flowers do? Oh, yes, she loves those. Well, then, why this bag of stuff? Well, it occurred to me that I sent my mom flowers last year. Yeah, so did I. Well, and a lovely card with the poems that she likes so much, also. What's wrong with that? Well, nothing. That's what I'm sending my mom this year. Well, that's great. She's a pushover for that stuff, just like mine is. So why don't you do that? Well, I got to thinking. With you, that could be dangerous. I know. It always gets me into lots of trouble. I'm waiting. Well, I remember that I had sent her flowers and a card the year before that, too. You said she loves them. Well, she does. So what's the big deal? Well, I realized I've sent my mom flowers and a card for the last seven years, ever since I left home. Wow, you never forgot? Never, I wasn't even late either. Wow, man, last year I almost forgot, but I sent like this extra large bouquet after Mother's Day to make up for it. It was on sale. <laughs> Did your mom like it? Yeah, of course. Well, what'd she say? Oh, something about how to extend Mother's Day for her. Gracious lady. Yeah. So. Why aren't you doing the flowers and card routine this year? Well, because I had realized it had become just that. Just that? Just that. Just what? Routine. Routine? Yeah. At the end of April, I'd go out and buy a card and order the flowers, and that was it. Every year. Ad nauseum. 
I mean, it had become a routine sort of thing, and it required very little thought on my part. Uh, oh. What's in the bag? Well, stuff. Stuff? Yep, stuff. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, I remember that when I was a kid, the gifts that pleased my mom most were the ones that came from me. I mean, the ones out of who I am. So, what is that? It's an ashtray. An ashtray. Yeah. Your mom doesn't smoke, and nobody in your family smokes. No, but she loved the ashtray me for when I was seven. That thing looks like it was made by a seven-year-old chimpanzee. <laughs> Mock not, my cynical friend. This could be the beginning of undiscovered genius. Yeah, so undiscovered it'll never be found. Well, my mom made me feel like it was undiscovered genius of the highest order. Yeah, moms are good at that. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was 10, I made my mom this paper mache brooch. It redefined the word tacky. <laughs> and she still wears it occasionally. I mean, really, last year at her Christmas party, mm -hmm. she got a brand new dress and she spent a fortune on her hair and she wore my pin. Wow. Yep, I'm discovered genius and I'm 35. <laughs> exactly, moms have a gift for that. So what else you got in there? Well, I have my mom's favorite flower. I thought I'd press these and send them through the mail. Dandelions? Yeah, dandelions. Oh, yes, they're my mom's favorite flower, too. I picked dandelions, and I put them in a, she put them in a crystal vase of a dining room table. See, dandelions. And, voila, the piece de la resistance. A card. Yes, I wrote the poem myself. Okay. I have a mom who's great to me. She loves and cares for me, you see. She's always there through thick and thin, and when I cry, she makes me grin. I love my mom for who she is. Her happy spirit makes me fizz. Mm -hmm. <laughs> fizz? Amy, that's like the worst poem I've ever heard. I know, just don't tell my mom that. Oh yeah, undiscovered genius. Yeah? Well, I've gotta go. Can you handle this work on your own? Cause I got some errands I gotta run. Well, I suppose so. What are you gonna do? I might go buy some modeling clay, construction paper, and maybe I'll cancel an order for some flowers. <laughs> well, good luck and have some fun. I will. Thanks, Amy. Hey, Joy. Yeah? Next year it'll be flowers in a card again. It will? Why? Well, because she really, truly does love them. But next year, it won't be a routine thing. And I hope that it'll never be a routine thing again. I might even write another poem. Amy, do your mom a favor? Buy her the card. I don't know, there just might be some undiscovered genius lurking there. This song is for our moms. Thank you, God, for blessing us with our mothers.
Let's thank him one more time as they leave. Uh, and we'd like to ask the children to head to Children's Church at this time. And uh, we'd ask everybody else just to please stand and greet a neighbor next to you to stand and uh, welcome some this morning. Wish them a happy Mother's Day. Just as a reminder, if you're new here this morning, we have Children's Church for those that are fifth grade and under. Also remind persons that we have a nursery for those that are three and under. And you're welcome to go down the hall and you'll find that there. right up to heaven. You all ready to rejoice?
so rejoice. Oh Lord, I lift my voice. I praise you and rejoice. You have made me whole, rejoice my soul.
out in the world outside and you stand as examples and shining beacons in your light to, to be examples of what faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ when that's really all. In Jesus' precious name, by the shed of his blood, we pray for this in his holy name.
The scripture reading for today comes from 1 Kings 17, 8 through 16, and 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, as listed in your bulletins. So if you would turn to Kings with me, that'd be great. Um, okay. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon, and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son so that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day of the Lord gives rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. In 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he, re he revered the Lord. But now his creator is coming to take my two boys and his sla as slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me what to... Tell me what you have in your house. Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. So she left him and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Let's pray. Father, it's so good to come and be together as your body and as your bride. I pray that when we leave today, we would love you more and we would know you better so that we can love you more. Um, I pray for Pastor Paul now as he tries to explain a little more of your character to us. Um, give him your words. Fill him with your spirit. Empower him. I just thank you that we have the opportunity to be here and to know you. I pray these things in the name of Jesus, the name above every other name. Amen. Amen. I had the um, privilege of going out and doing a little Mother's Day shopping yesterday. <clears throat> I don't know how many other people had that same uh, adventure as fathers, maybe, or as persons shopping for your mothers or whatever you're doing. But um, I have found that Mother's Day shopping is an interesting adventure because you have the perception of the children and what they would like to purchase their parents. Then you have the perception of probably what the parent actually wants. And I noticed this yesterday when I'm with my children. I won't mention them by names. Um, you can figure out which one probably identifies with which gift. One daughter thought my, my wife would desperately need a curling iron the other daughter thought lotions and perfumes would be well needed by, by uh, my mom, or by the, her mom. Another one thought a bow and arrow set would be the ideal gift. <laughs> you know, mom just needed to go out in the backyard, play a little archery, and um, you know, she'd be a much better mom that way. And I tried to explain to this young child that perhaps mom's interest in archery was not the same as um, his or her own. And um, never quite got it. So then we moved into the truck stations. Well, maybe mom would like a truck. So maybe you had some similar experiences. It's tough, isn't it? 
to buy something special for that someone you love. It's tough. I got a question for you this morning. I want you to think about an unsung hero in your life. An unsung hero. That person that maybe was in your life that was significant to you. It might have been your mother. It may have been your father. It may have been a teacher or a pastor. But someone that was significant to you that was not perhaps well-known, not famous, maybe significant to a handful of other people, but most of all significant to you, a hero in your life, someone that taught you or you looked up to. I'm going to give you a few moments to, to talk to a neighbor next to you and to share an unsung hero in your life. Go ahead, you can talk about how much you enjoy doing this, and, or you can actually share what you're supposed to share, but whatever. Just take a few moments, talk with somebody next to you. Well, maybe you listed, uh, well, some of you are still talking. I'm sorry, I'll wait. Sorry, I'm being patient there. Well, hopefully you listed maybe your mother or stepmom or grandmother or some person that was maybe a, a, a teacher in your life, someone that you thought was a wonderful person but perhaps was never really recognized. Do you think that you have to be recognized in order to be a hero? Do you feel that way? It seems like so many things in our culture are based on recognition. And so many things that we lift up as persons who are what I would call heroes are not heroes at all. They may be famous, they may be well known, but are they really heroes? Are they persons that are going around changing lives? I think, for example, a lot of people in the entertainment industry you know their picture, you see them on People magazine, you see them on these TV shows, these talk shows. When it boils down to it, what a significance have they contributed to those around them or to our culture? Entertainment stars, what about athletes? Wonderful people. I love hanging out, uh, listening to the twins on the radio or watching them on TV. Different athletes that enter into our lives that maybe we consider modern day heroes. What do they really contribute? How are our lives changed? If we get a dome or we don't get a dome in Minnesota, will our lives be broken or, or made on that basis? If you listen to sometimes the television and the radio, you'd think that the dome is the, the crux of and the importance of the pinnacle of Minnesota. I won't get any political debates here, but is it really that powerful? Does it really affect that many lives? I'd like to share with you this morning, I think the true heroes don't always get the recognition they deserve. But I think that's okay. In fact, I think that's great. I think that's God's way. To use people behind the scenes, to use those humble spirits, and maybe they get some notoriety, maybe they don't, but they serve continuously, constantly, and in loving ways. Let's look at our scriptures this morning. If you have your Bible, I'm going to hear a little shuffling out there, or turn some papers just to humor me. Okay? Shuffle your bulletin. There you go. Rattle keys, thank you very much. New electronic Bible over in the corner. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 17, 8 through 16. And we have here the story of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. Now this is an example of someone who doesn't get much credit, but does a tremendous work in the sight of God. You have here, the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. And I've commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he goes there and he talks to this widow. And he convinces her, who thinks she's going to die, who has very little food left, to, to make for him a meal. And he tries to convince her that if he does this, or she does this, excuse me, that she will be um, given continued sustenance. So she does exactly what he says. He says, Elijah says to her, don't be afraid. Go home and as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me. Typical guy, isn't it here? <laughs> make my food first, then make some for yourself and what you have, and bring it to me. Then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, the jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry, 
This is basically what happens. Is that exactly what he prophesied because of her, her constant love and understanding and her faith to take a leap of faith, if you will. To do this, she's blessed by it. Then we have a similar story. If you flip over to 2 Kings from our scripture reading, this widow doesn't have a name. It just is, the story is known as the widow's oil. But it talks about here that the widow and Elisha. Now, if you remember our scriptures, when we're working our way through the Old Testament, we have the prophecy, or the prophecy, prophet Elijah, who is prophesying um, to the, what they call a divided kingdom. In other words, at this point in history, if you've been studying the scriptures that we've been handing out, there's a time when Solomon has passed away, and two of his sons have taken over. And they divide the kingdom to a southern half, which is known as Judah, and a northern half, which is Israel. There's two tribes in the tribe of Judah, and there's ten tribes in the tribe of Israel. And these prophets come to try to rehabilitate Judah during this time, during this time of um, testing, if you will. And after Elijah spends his time prophesying and doing ministry, he then passes on his cloak, literally. He lays it on the shoulder of Elisha and says, now you go for it. It's your turn now. So we have this story of Elisha shortly after he's taken over and is now um, leading as a prophet in the country. And it says here in, in chapter 4, the widow's oil. It says, the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he reserved, re revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming. Basically, if you know the Old Testament traditions, what's happening here is it was common that a woman could not own property. A woman could not um, have a sense of wealth if, as we would understand it today in terms of inheritance. That's why the Levitical laws were set up in such a way that either the husband's brother should take care of her or she should go back to her father to take care of her or she should um, uh, remarry again and as a second wife. They have a number of different laws written out there, but in essence, someone needs to help take care of her. Now, that's may kind of stand the face of what we think of our, our, our culture today and the way we deal with things economically, but this explains why she's in debt or why she has a problem. In other words, many times what happened in this situation is she would have to either sell herself or her children into slavery as an indentured servant, and she would live with someone else and get room and board, but then have to work for the rest of her life as an indentured servant. But Elisha replied to her in verse 2, he says, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she's very negative. She says, your servant has nothing at all except a little oil. Then Elisha, similar promise to Elijah, says, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. And so she goes forth and does all that. And then, of course, we know the end of the story. She, too, is blessed because of her faith. Because of this faith, she not only can provide for Elisha, but also for her family. And there's enough to sell at the end to, to care for her through her retirement, if you will. Another incredible story of a woman behind the scenes and yet, she's hardly recognized. You see Elijah and you see Elisha, these wonderful prophets. But if it wasn't for these two women, neither one of these men would have been able to do their ministry. Sometimes we forget that, don't we? Of the wonderful people that do the little things in life, those little things that we forget about that allow other things to happen or occur. Just an interesting side note, if you're following your notes this morning, 1D says Elijah's name is a combination of two God names not two go-go names. I just want to clarify that. If you have your sheet this morning, cross out go-go and write in God names. I don't want to have uh, any rumors going around. It's the, the words Elohim, which is the, the, the Jewish word, or Hebrew word, excuse me, for um, God, and a combination of Yahweh. So if you take El, also in El Shaddai, that word El or Lord, and then Yahweh, the Yah, you have um, Elijah, Elijah. It's almost like saying, God is powerful is a literal translation, or God, God. It's um, maybe like you've heard in Hispanic communities, Jesus or Jesus named a child. So they were saying that this person was claimed by God and had the power of God. And he kind of mysteriously appears, Elijah does, and he mysteriously disappears. We talked about that in our 845 Bible study this morning, how he was just taken up, if you remember the story, into the chariots of fire. And his horsemen come in, they swoop him down, they take him up into the sky, and he never sees death. He never sees death. He goes right into the presence of the Lord bodily. Well, true hurdles always don't get the recognition they deserve. I want you just to, to think a little bit. I'm going to ask you a question. What are some of those people in our culture, in our community, and maybe in our church, that don't get the recognition they deserve? And this is not rhetorical. I'm actually going to call on you to think of something and say it out loud. What are some of these people? 
our culture and our community. Oh, right away. <laughs> the music team says it right away. The technical crew. We'll hold our, we'll do like I do in Rotary when they have a lot of people clap, but we just do one clap. So go like this all together. Put your hands up. There we go. Saves time. All right. The technical crew. What else? Our hospitality. We love having our coffee and our donuts and our cookies after church. How about that? Our teachers. We're here enjoying worship. And I just went through the chaos section just a little bit ago. <laughs> They're out there having a great time. Some of the kids are in prison right now. I noticed them. They were trying to escape. They have a, this Paul and Silas thing going. Others over there are doing Mother's Day gifts and there's glue flying. And so our teachers are doing an awesome job. Ready? What else? Yes. People that clean up after church, if you, if you ever want to be given a blessing by God, just stay after some Sunday. And I mean that all seriously. Put some chairs away, sweep up, help take a screen down. We're always short people, particularly after the worship service. We are a time limit here, and we have to get out here a little afternoon, and sometimes that time gets crunched because the pastor preaches too long. So you really need to stay after sometime and just help out. Yeah, it would be a blessing for those. You already spoke. Well, I'm going to pick on other people for a while. Okay. <laughs> Anybody that feeds the worship team, I heard snacks and hospitality, now I'm here for Jackie and bringing food. So a meal for once a month. Let's, yes. Their nursery, wonderful care they're getting. And they're not even just being babysat. If you've ever gone in there, it's incredible. They try to teach them a lesson, even at three and under. They, if you so need it, I love our youth kids when they go in there to help out because I see you guys, you read them stories in the corner while they go in there and they'll actually play with the kids, not just put them behind in a room and let them fend for themselves. It's wonderful. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Little, little clap. There we go. Move on. <laughs> yeah. I think our youth leaders are incredible. We have our small group leaders. We have all the people that many times you don't even see. And behind the scenes, they're nurturing our youth and raising up other disciples. Deb Marzon, she basically runs the church, you're right. And between her and Shelly, they just tell me what to do. And that's, um, exactly. Yes, our prayer chain, one of the foundations of our church. They pray on Wednesday nights, they put a, a seat of foundation around our church, a, a spiritual covering, and it's just awesome. And just as a little plug, if you want to pick up a prayer book that's just powerful that they're going through right now, it's called Partners in Prayer. They're on the information table, and it's just a life-changing book. You may want to grab one from our information table. Yes. Shelly Yost. What does she do? Oh, yeah. She's our office administrator, and she's also worked in a number of work areas from inreach to outreach to, to um, worship. She's um, children. She serves um, particularly on Wednesday nights right now and does a lot of stuff. So. Our entire leadership team, people that dedicate hours and hours and hours to do the, the kind of structure and the business of our church. Yes. People make us feel welcome, greeters and ushers and all those that are helping us with hospitality, signing names in and so forth. Great. The congregation as a whole. Let's, we'll clap for that one. Here we go. I don't want to go in, but I think there's a lot we could continue to lift up from our outreach to our inreach, to our staff relations, all the work here at the church. And there's so many people in our culture that get left out too. Our teachers, they work hard and diligently in our schools. Our factory workers that care for the needs that we have products. We have people in our transportation industry in our church that serve diligently, making sure people can get to and from work or to and from where they need to go. If I look at all the occupations represented just in our church alone, I'm just amazed. And what a blessing each and every one of you. Each and one of you have a ministry. And many times you don't get the credit you deserve. You may go into work every day and not have a boss that appreciates your fine skills. You may have a teacher that thinks that somehow that they are grading you just by your grade and that's what the box they put you in and you're a much finer student than they give you credit for. Or maybe you're a young person and you think your parents maybe don't appreciate you as much as you think you, they should. Or you're a parent and you don't think your children appreciate you as much as you think they should. So many times we look for that credit or what we deserve. But what's blessing from our scripture is we see that true heroes don't always get recognized, even those most powerful ones. But God recognizes them and that's the key. Our second point this morning is that God uses unlikely prospects to do miraculous things. He uses unlikely prospects. In the first story of Elijah, which we didn't even cover in the scripture text, 
God uses a raven, a blackbird, what's called an unclean animal. And he uses that raven to feed Elijah in the wilderness, to bring bread and meat. Then a second feeding comes from a widow. Again, someone that would have been on the outside of the culture, someone that would not have been looked up to as someone that would have had a lot to provide. And through that humbling experience of humbling Elijah through a raven and a widow, he lifts them up to do powerful ministry. We notice both Elijah and Elisha were both women were widows. He used these widows, which at that time, as I already mentioned, were people lowly in their, in their society. 2 Kings 4.3 talks about how he has a sense of faith there. He says, Elisha said, Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars, and don't just ask for a few. I love that phrase. If you have your Bible, circle that one. Don't just ask for a few. It's talking about God's abundance. And then when we step out in faith, don't just ask for a few. But to be bold. We're an unlikely church to be buying 80 acres of land, aren't we? Think about it. We're an unlikely church to be trying to raise a million and a half for our first phase development with the number of people we have coming. We're an unlikely prospect looking at some of your, your pastoral leadership to be doing a lot of these things. But that's how God does it. It's almost like an irony. God uses those that are least qualified to do miraculous things. And he says, do it in a bold way. Isn't that great? Do we have a great God? God is good? Oh, you're still catching it. That's great. One of the keys to this provision in C, 2C, if you're taking notes this morning, is that God provides for those who love him. God provides for those who love him. And there is a sense of that many times when we lose that sense of faith, it's we lose that sense of love simultaneously. One of the things in here in the scripture that is so loud and clear with both Elijah and Elisha, and even the women who are following, is that love for God. And when we have that love of God, God just wants to pour out his blessing. It's just like a mother wanting to pour her blessing on her children. You love children. You want to bless them. God is the same way. In fact, he's referred to in Scripture is that he's like a mother hen who wants to take care of his chicks and bring them unto himself. It's not an often used Scripture, is it? Think of God as mother. But he does have that reference. In other words, God is a nurturer, one that wants to take care of us. In 1712, one of the things I think is key here too is it says that she knew the name of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Is that this widow knew the name of the Lord. 1 Kings 17 that she knew him. In other words, this was not somebody that Elijah had to introduce her to. She already knew God. She'd probably been praying for God, praying for that miracle. And the miracle came through the form of Elijah. Elijah had been praying for a miracle, and it came in the form of the widow. And the two met, and they were able to care and provide for each other. I want to share with you a story about kind of that passing on. And some of you today, you're in that in-between time. I was talking with one mother of she's not only trying to celebrate her own Mother's Day, but she's trying to figure out how to go to her husband's mother's house, and she's trying to figure out how to go to take care of her own mother's house. And she says, well, I can't really enjoy Mother's Day because I'm trying to care for two other moms at the same time. Maybe when they pass away, I'll get my Mother's Day. And she was just kind of kidding around. But there's a sense of frenetic, it's just a sense of hurriedness and busyness that takes place. But sometimes really enjoy the things that we are our blessings. And this mother was just sharing the fact that how many times is, do we wish that we were given recognition, but then realizing we do receive that recognition anyway? The story I want to share with you is about a mom who was just having one of those Mother's Day experiences with her daughter. And they were celebrating it, and then in the midst of their celebration, the daughter had to share some pretty serious news. She was 32 years old, and she shared with her mom that she'd been just um, diagnosed with cancer. And the mom didn't quite know how to respond to that because it's one of the things when the mom has cancer because you think, well, they're older and they're going to you know, have to deal with that sooner in their life. But her daughter was only 32 and had three beautiful children. When they started to talk about it, it kind of was a downer, if you want to say, for Mother's Day, to say the least. But yet, they already had a plan in place of how to take care of it. They had the chemotherapy, the surgery, all the things lined up. So for the next three to six months, her mom was a mother again, taking care of her daughter taking her to and from the hospital, taking her to and from the clinic visits. And they rekindled their friendship that they'd had, not really had since she would, before she got her driver's license, as they joked around. They said, you know, once you start driving, you start losing that connectedness. Well, now mom had to be the transport again. And they laughed about all the times she'd taken her to the soccer, soccer games and to the 
to the different um, events at school for dances. And they looked back at those times, and now, once again, she was counting on her mom for rides. But in the process of their chemotherapy, her treatment got worse, and her cancer spread. And they, um, they came to the point of realization that perhaps she would not beat this. And then the mom didn't know quite what to do. She didn't know how to be a mom anymore to this daughter that was dying. She never expected to have this role in her mothering. And so she just finally asked me, she goes, is there anything that I can do to help you during this final time? She said, yes. I want you at the given point to be a mom for my kids when they need you when I'm gone. And there's a special way I want you to do that, is I want to make some tapes of all the talks I want to give my children that I know I will never be able to do. So the mother took a tape recorder and a machine, she went to the, to the hospital, and she gave the, the mother-daughter talk and the mother-son talk about the birds and the bees. You'll have to ask your parents about it later. And then they gave the, um, the mother-daughter talk about the first date. They had the mother-daughter and the mother-son talks about what it's going to be like to pack up and go off to college. And the mother-son-daughter talks when they first have their wedding day to play this tape. And so she had all the tapes recorded for the special time and an event in the kid's life so their mother could be there for all those passages in time. And said so the hardest tape for her to make was a tape when she said, when your dad gets remarried. And she gave a talk. And in the talk she said, someday your daddy's going to love another person just like he loves mommy. What I want you to do is respect that woman, to care for her like you care for me, and to love her just as you love me. Five years later, the hardest thing that grandma had to do was to play that tape for her children when the new mommy walked down the aisle. In essence, Elijah had to have a tape that he made for Elisha. He said, this ministry is now yours. I'm passing this on to you. You may not get the recognition you deserve. In fact, I know you won't. You'll be ridiculed, beaten, and rejected. But I'm passing on my cloak to you. And maybe you'll understand this gift later on. But I want you to understand as best as you can now. The final point I'd like to make this morning is point three, that moms are quiet heroes who often do things behind the scenes that are not recognized but that change the lives of others. That change the lives of others. I could go on with story after story of our great nation's leaders, from Abraham Lincoln to George Washington to Teddy Roosevelt to, to um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. There's stories of moms that just nurtured their children in incredible ways. And because of their nurturing, their children turned out incredibly well and did incredible things. One of my favorite stories is just Susanna Wesley. And if you know anything about Susanna Wesley, she had the son, John Wesley, who founded the United Methodist Church and the Wesleyan Movement. She had 18 children. Think about that. She homeschooled them all, taught them Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. So you think you're busy. Just think about that one for a change if you're a mom. <laughs> but these moms are these quiet heroes. <clears throat> I want to look at this Widow Seraphith passage one more time in 2 Kings 4.4. 4. It's an interesting line here. It says, Go outside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. Shut the door behind you. In other words, the miracle did not draw attention to itself. You know, he could have easily just poured all the jars out in the front and just stuck them out there for everybody to walk by and go, wow, look what Elijah's doing. Look what Elisha's doing, excuse me. Look what the widow's doing. Look at this miracle in front of us. But he said, no, do it behind closed doors. Remember Jesus, when he turned water into wine, what did he do? Did he go in front of the wedding party and all the guests and have these empty jars of water and just said, well, look what I'm going to do. Boom, water into wine, water into wine, water into wine. No. Only the servants knew. Remember the story? He did it behind the scenes, realizing that the blessing would come from God. So many times I forget that. I don't know about you, but sometimes I crave recognition. I look for ways to elevate myself rather than humble myself. When I read things like this, it just humbles me to think that that's what true leadership is about. Not just for mothers, but for all of us. In fact, I think mothers get it quite well. I think, guys, we need to look at ourselves sometimes. As fathers, I don't know if we get that same sense of perspective. Sometimes we need to look at why we do certain things. I'm going to close with you with one short story. It's a story about another mom whose name was Kathy. 
And Kathy was a working mom, and she often had to go out on different adventures and so forth because she was a salesperson. And so she'd be called to meetings and to different things around the country. And Kathy was okay with this. She was pretty used to it. But then all of a sudden, her husband, Nate, had a new job. And Nate asked Kathy if they could move to another part of the country, which means that for her sales job, she'd be traveling even more. But because they loved each other, they, they packed up their bags and they went. And they moved to actually Alaska. And their son, um, Rick, was also a part of their family. Came with them, of course. And Rick was just a small little child, about two and a half years old. And this whole traveling and switching homes and everything was, was difficult for him. But Rick, all of a sudden, when he was up there, started to get used to the climate, got used to the changes. And one of the things that the parents did this to kind of help Rick in this um, transition is they went out and bought him a binky. How many of you parents know what a binky is? All right, I've got some parents out there. That's a, a key word for blanket, okay? But it's one of those pet things that sometimes kids have. And I know my daughters, I won't mention which ones again, or son. Um, there's a few of them that um, have one of those binkies that still to this day, when we go on camping trips, they can't forget the binky. And maybe you've had a son or daughter, maybe some of you yourself still sleep with your binkies. I won't talk about any, won't mention any names here, but I've been on a few youth retreats and I've seen some interesting things come out of the bag, so. So maybe you have that binky or that stuffed toy or that thing that really makes you feel secure and loved. Well, little Rick had this thing too, and Ricky is what they called him. And he just loved his, his new binky, his new stuff, or his new um, blanket that was a sense of security. And he used to have it every night when his mom and dad would tuck him in, and he'd have it snuggled right underneath his chin. Well, one night, his dad came to tuck him in. And so Nate got little Ricky in there to get him a story, and he's looking and goes, where's your binky? And little Rick got a little period eye and didn't say anything. And just then the phone rings. And Kathy calls up and says, you know, this is just terrible. I'm all the way down in Texas, and I was unpacking my bags. And I realized in my hurry this morning, I grabbed everything off the bed, and I grabbed little Rinky's, Ricky's binky. And it's here in my suitcase. And you can see the look on Nate, the, the father going, oh my gosh, how am I going to get through tonight? <laughs> Some of your parents have been through this, right? <laughs> and so Nate's going, okay, okay, thanks for calling. I'm, I'm sure we'll get through this together. I'm sure it'll be just fine. And so Nate's thinking to himself, how am I going to explain this to my son? And how we can just get through this night together. Maybe I'll have him sleep in my bed, or maybe I can do this and, and do that, and maybe get him a snack, or maybe I can wear him out, watch videos all night. What I can ever do just to get him to go to sleep? And I want to tell you what, the, what happened in this ending here was Nate goes in to tuck his son Rick into bed. He says, Little Ricky, I just want to share with you. That was mom. She called to tell you I love you and how much she misses you. But she also wanted to let you know um, that this morning when she left in such a hurry, she took your binky. And she's really sorry, but she'll get back home in two days and you can have your binky back then. And little Ricky said, well, don't worry. I gave mommy my blanket so that she wouldn't feel scared while she was gone. Little Ricky knew what she needed when she was away. And mommy was concerned about her, about him. But the boy was concerned about his mom. And this went cold to the proverb. It says, raise a child in the way that he should go. When he or she is older, they will not depart from it. When we invest in our children and in our youth, they will become the next generation of unsung heroes. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for this time together today to celebrate the heroes in our midst and the heroes that are not in our midst. And Lord, we thank you for this time. And Lord, as we pray, in this closing time, we just want to remember those persons silently. There may be our quiet heroes, those persons in our lives that touched us. Maybe our mother, maybe a stepmom, maybe a grandma, maybe that person who's now gone that we remember this day. But Lord, we just know that there are those people that touched us and made us who we are. And we lift them up this day. And Lord, there may be someone here today that doesn't have a relationship with you, Lord. And they need that sense of love. Maybe they never got it from their mother. Maybe they never got it from a, a person close to them. But they can realize that through you, and through the power of your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, that they can experience that kind of love, the love of an unsung hero in their heart. We just pray for that this day. That's in your name we pray. Amen. This time we're receiving our offering. I'd just like to remind persons that may be a guest here today, they're not obligated to give. We share in God's resources as a way of giving back to God the love we feel for Him.
So, now that we've uh, had our spiritual nourishment for the morning, and we've been, we've been blessed with these wonderful gifts that God gave us, now it's time to take everything that we've gotten this morning from God, and uh, after we leave this place, take it out and share it with everybody that we come in contact with. Have a happy Mother's Day, and God bless you all. to love, honor, and serve the Lord. Have a wonderful week. Happy Mother's Day.